So now you're, we're getting really sort of to the part that is most, um, is, is the most different about dynamic field theory compared to other connections that uh, approaches. Good. So um, I'll be talking about autonomy in dynamic field theory as a little sketch here of the kinds of things I'll be talking about sequentially um, achieving some functions. And we begin by pointing to the obvious, you know, essentially all thinking and acting consists of sequences of things, right? Sequences of movements, movement, elementary movements of more complex movements, actions, multiple actions, or of perceptual states, attentional states, uh, paying attention to different objects, and ultimately mental uh, operations, like you know, making inferences, you know, generating a sentence, you know, selecting the next concept to focus on, and so on. Sometimes these sequences are in a fixed order. This would be the case for a lot of low-level motor behaviors. We're very automatic. Uh, when you reach uh, and grasp, you, know, you don't have to think about first opening your hand and then closing it. That is um, very automatic and in fact, tightly coupled, the, the transport and the grasp. Um, other sequences can become kind of automatic. For instance, when you're driving home, then the different steps would be uh, highly root, uh, uh, habitual uh, routine, which you can actually fall into sometimes inadvertently, and it frees attention to do other things at the same time. But sometimes they are very flexible, like when I'm speaking. Well, maybe my, my talks are now highly routine because I've given them so often, but still, you know, whenever you do something intellectual, you're actually doing it in the moment and you're thinking in the moment and you're, you're you know, making a sequence of thoughts and communications and so on. It's often studied in the lab in, in by asking people to do some arbitrary things, some arbitrary order, which actually turns out to be not so easy if you tell someone a telephone number or my son used to play a game with me, which I was found very fun where he, when he was small, <laughs> when he, like he would do certain actions and have to imitate those. And, and it's, it's arbitrary actions like, you know, uh, turning over a book and then putting something on top of something and so on. And it's, it's a, uh, actually interesting topic, sometimes studied clinically by uh, psychologists under the label of coursey tasks. Um, how much, uh, how long a sequence like that can you actually remember and how, how easy can you generalize that? And that's connected to what in cognitive science is called productivity. To the, so the idea that you would be able to reach a maybe theoretically unlimited set of possible sequences of things. It's often thought of as in terms of language, but you could also think of that in terms of, for instance, actions or arithmetic operations and so on that you could in principle uh, be generating. So how, how does that happen? In our thinking, is a, is, a, is a challenge. Actually, that challenge is, is in all of the approaches, but we can put our finger on what the challenge is. Um, our challenge is that each state that's meaningful, a behavior or a mental state, is an attractor. Right? We've argued that that is needed to link to the sensory motor surfaces to have stability. Um, that's a prerequisite to get anything going, uh, really as physical behavior, and to tie it to perception. But uh, attractors resist change. That's their very definition. And a sequence requires that you change, that you get rid of the previous state, go to a new state. So there's a conflict between those. So clearly you have to do something about that. And the answer will be that you have to induce a instability of the previously stable attractor to then access the new attractor. So I will be talking first about um, the mathematical mechanism of how that happens. And, and that's about um, the destabilization part. How do you systematically destabilize? That's a condition of, the satisfac uh, of satisfaction. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I'll talk then about how you then select the next thing to do. I'll do this around an example. This is the example that we also historically used to develop the, these ideas. This was Julius and Demiska's doctoral dissertation work and um, I'll show you some, 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 actual, some actual robotic implementation in a moment. So the task was chosen um, as a serial order task, so arbitrary 
sequences, arbitrary as such, but they were defined. And I'll show you how. There's a three missing here. So um, you essentially taught the system to reach colored objects in a particular order. So first you want to go for a blue one, then for a green one, and then third for a, uh, sorry, a red one, and then third for a green one. And, um, and that was done by a vehicle that just drives around to see in the moment. And the important thing about that is that that vehicle doesn't actually have a real world map and so on. So it actually is just as a visual search. It's like a visual search by moving around. And it takes unpredictable amounts of time for the vehicle to find these targets. Could hypothetically even not find one because maybe there is none. And it's supposed to still stick to the order that is supposed to uh, really, um, let's say, try to find the blue one. And only once it's found the blue one to switch to the red one. And if it just happens to see a red one, but it's still on uh, the first color, then it's supposed to ignore that red one and go to the blue one. So that's a, a, an important challenge because um, that's you know, where the stability comes about, the stability of resisting distractors. It's a stability of a mental state, of an intention to go to the, the blue one that you want to stabilize. And uh, dynamical field theory solves that problem because all of our meaningful states are stable. And then we can sort of see how you release the system from stability. And uh, it's at this point that I can maybe clarify that there are um, connections architectures have been that deal with sequence generation, for instance, famous, uh, famously Elman's model, which is often used for that. But they are not good at that. They're all based on essentially sequences. Essentially, they're just sets of transients where one triggers the next or they are um, essentially something like an oscillatory system that uh, where once you've done an oscillation, then you go somewhere else. And there is very abstract mathematical analysis of these things that I wasn't going to go into, but that when someone called Rabinovich in, in California sort of analyzed that, and one could say our approach is sort of the mathematically correct for solution to this problem and recognizes that you have to have something that's an attractor and then becomes unstable once you get, in a sense, you get close to, to that what the attractor is about. Um, and I'll formalize that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, here's the robotic demonstration uh, version of this. Sorry, I wanted to stop the video. Um, so uh, here is the teaching task. So in the teaching task, uh, the operator that's actually here in this case, uh, video in which he did that, shows to this robot the different, different objects of different colors. Apparently, this is the order in which he shows this robot these objects. And what she actually does is, is you see that every time she shows this, she moves it a little closer at the end. And that actually will turn out to be the trigger for the system to recognize that now one demonstration is done. And then in a separate uh, setting, she uh, distributed these objects you know, every time afresh. I don't have that idea, she just built that scene. And now the, op the robot is looking like here's, it found a, a yellow one and uh, it's now found the red one. And now it's looking for a green one, which I think there's one here and one there. And so for instance, now it takes a lot of time to find the green one. Just the, the vehicle is just doing obstacle avoidance it will, um, it has a, a behavior which we'll see in a moment that once it has seen a green one, maybe here it finds this one, then it actually heads for the green one until the green one is very large on its visual array. And so, sometimes it runs into green one because here, here for instance, it, it doesn't take the red one because it's now looking for blue. And I think it will be finding blue uh, here. And uh, now we didn't buy the system to not use a cable, so it's a bit awkward. And then uh, once it has the blue one, it will be, I think, right? I don't know how long it takes, maybe it goes to this blue one. There in the back, yeah, now, now it has the blue one. And then it has to go for a red one again. And after some excursion, it will here, it goes to the red one. And in fact, in the next slide, I've sort of made this comparison. Here it goes by the red one when it isn't the target and here, it goes to the red one when it is the target. And that um, difference, that, that is you know, the key property of the system to be able to control that. So how is that done? So we, we uh, 
came up with this idea uh, inspired by John Searle's philosophical analysis of intention systems. And Jan Tekul will be uh, teaching about that on um, Friday. And I will actually also briefly refer to his work after this. Uh, so uh, you know, it has a very different background, but it's a sort of idea that if you intend to achieve something, this is intention now in the motor sense of, you know, you have a desire to bring something about and, uh, and, and there will be an action. And, you know, when are you done with that action? And he thought about you know, those things as conditions of satisfaction also plays a role in language. Some of you might know that. That's where the idea originally came from. Uh, his theory about speech acts. And uh, so the uh, idea was to turn that into a neural process element, a control element of neural processes. And so the notion was that um, anything that in this sequence is a state that we have, we call this now intention state by analogy. So something I want to bring about here would be just a color I want to achieve. It does two things. It um, controls the sensory motor system in this case, I'll explain that in a moment, how the vehicle to guide that to this action. And on the other hand, it makes a prediction about what would be perceived when, when you're done. Uh, so that would be pre-activating a, a field, but not yet creating a peak in the field. Uh, that represents these perceptual outcomes here to very trivially it's also color right you intend to have a color and the outcome will be a color and uh, what then happens is that when the the perception you have matches that prediction then this system will become activated and a detection event will happen and that will inhibit the original intention and will bring about a switch to the next action i'll explain that now in a little, a little bit more detail so here is the basis for perception for that system. So it has these camera images. It's actually only interested in the horizontal dimension because it's only about heading direction, you know, just like yesterday. And so what we're doing is along every um, horizontal position, we're summing across the vertical and building a color histogram, very simple. And uh, so the number of pixels that fall into a particular color will be the strength of that color. So we do that, so for instance, that an object that is large on the visual array will have a large extent in the vertical direction that make these peaks very large. And so when, when the system gets close to a colored object, it will be uh, have a larger strength, that color signal. So it's not the uh, luminance, also it's the size on the vertical size on the visual array that controls the strength of the color signal. So that color representation, you know, a long color, uh, can be combined with a representation along the horizontal spatial position and you have a 2D spatial field, you know, space versus color. So this peak here would be, for instance, the result of that input from the visual array. And so on that, you can do visual search. You learned how visual search is done yesterday by uh, putting, in this case, literally a ridge along space at a particular color into the system. So this, this is just 1D space. So it's really the example that I showed while uh, Raoul Grieben will show you tomorrow a, uh, the, the, the real version with two-dimensional vision for, for actual humans. Um, and so what uh, will be arranged is that uh, when a, a two-dimensional input matches the ridge, a peak will be formed and that peak will be uh, here, like a peak will actually control the robot heading to that color, sort of analogous to the uh, a robot, the Phono Texas robot, there was a sound source that created the peak of in heading direction. And here it's now, you read out this, the spatial position and control the heading direction of the robot to then approach that object. And all the while you're representing also, um, a, you have a perceptual representation of color. And in that perceptual representation, a large amplitude peak will arise when uh, the, uh, an object is uh, you know, very, very close because it um, has a lot of vertical pictures like this one and that one create more of an amplitude here than this little green one. Um, so this perception input is an input into the condition of satisfaction field. The condition of satisfaction field is pre-shaped, now again, relative to that perception information by the intention. So if you're looking for this color, then there is a certain amount of input into this color, but sub-threshold. And only when that's matched by a corresponding peak in the color histogram at the same color does this peak have a chance to fire and the condition of satisfaction fires. And then the condition of satisfaction 
inhibits the intention. And after that inhibition, the field system is able to bring up the next pigment. I didn't, I haven't explained so far how that actually, how that bring up the next field is. This is a slightly different implementation. I just took that because it's such a cool live video. So here you see the condition of satisfaction firing at just a single neuron here. And you see here the ridge coming up. Every time a, a, a condition of satisfaction fires, the system switches to the next color. I haven't explained how that works. So a new peak arises here. And you know, so it has a candidate here, but hasn't yet uh, been large enough. Now it's really large on the retina and it will be firing here, firing, and then you switch to a new color. Right? So that's how the discrete stuff emerges, right? The, here it's the vehicle moving around in the world that makes these things separate in time. And, so what, what happens is that it is it's moving at, at constant speed. So as it is moving constant speed, events happen. And these are these detection events when the match is detected in the system then switches to the next event. So that's a sensory motor example of that sort of autonomous sequence generation. Here is uh, the fine structure of that just to make this and uh, drive this point home. So you have, it's a slightly different model that I'll explain a little later. So this is the, the uh, a node that represents what you're currently looking for. And uh, that node expresses this particular color you're looking for, it's so a peak in the color field. This is the condition of satisfaction. It's pre-activated at that color. And this is when you're actually having that color large on your visual array. So a peak is formed here. As this peak is formed, this here becomes inhibited. So you see they all become inhibited. And because the intention is no longer there, this peak decays. And um, as this peak decays, the prediction decays. So because the prediction is no longer there, the current input doesn't have that effect anymore. This peak becomes unstable. And as this peak becomes unstable, something else happens, which I haven't explained, that, that some other node comes up and then it does the next step. And I'm explaining how this selection happens in a little later, but if you take for granted that it happens, then the outcome of this is that the system is able to reproduce the serial order in a way that is now decoupled from the timing. So, so what you're in teaching, these, um, the colors were presented in somewhat almost rhythmic fashion by the human demonstrator. So you have these different colors uh, almost for the same amount of time, but actually inside there, the same thing happens because when Julia was pushing the optic closer, the, the condition of satisfaction fired and the uh, system switched to the next um, number that it was storing. I haven't explained exactly how that happened. And um, during per performance then, the same colors, red, blue, green, blue, yellow, were uh, now activated, but uh, there were you know, arbitrary amounts of time that the system was able to s stabilize an intention until it detected that this uh, intention had now been satisfied. Now that's the core idea. So the underlying mathematical mechanism is um, summarized here by this slide. It's a sort of, uh, if you think about this more generally, it's an idea that you have an excitatory system and an inhibitory system that if this neural representation is inhibitory, it inhibits, this is the start here, inhibits the intention. We call it the thing that you controls what you're aiming at the intention and the thing that says that you're done, the condition of satisfaction. And so the intention has these effects of affecting downstream structures, which in the example I just showed you is an extrasensory motor system, but it could also be just a purely neural system, just some neural machinery, like this mental mapping machinery. Um, and either of those could then generate events, for instance, perceptual events, detections, but also neural events, for instance, just having been able having stored a, a peak, a peak comes up, let's say in the a mental map. And as that peak comes up, it creates a detection. And that detection can feed into the condition of satisfaction. The condition of satisfaction can also be, is also fed by a prediction, what, what the outcome, the desired outcome is of that intention. So in the example uh, I, I had, I just showed you the, uh, these dimensions are the same as you know, color in both cases, but in general, these would be different potentially different uh, dimensions. This can be discrete, can be categorical, or it can be continuous and, and then it's a real match. So, so what happens inside here is 
in a sense, a sequence of instabilities, right? The condition of satisfaction is pre-shaped in the sense I introduced in the first lecture by the intention field. That is, there's some input that is already there when what, every, what, what I'm talking about now happens, and it is in a sub-threshold state. And when that, uh, uh, when, when there's a matching input that pushes that pre-shape through the detection instability, uh, then the condition of satisfaction field becomes active. As it becomes you know, super threshold, it inhibits the intention field. And what happens in the intention field is now a reverse detection instability. That is, this peak through this inhibition is deleted. The system goes to a sub threshold state. Because this peak goes through a sub threshold state, its predictive input goes away. And things are tuned such that that makes the condition of satisfaction go through a reverse detection instability. And then both fields are sub-thresholds, they're, they're off. So now you're done with this intention. And the next thing I'll discuss is how then the next thing happens. So you, it will only, so, so the idea is that sequence generation is first of all based on ending a state. Self, it's like self-termination. And that you then do something else, you know, that is a question of, what else you have on your mind and, and what other behavioral structure you have. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Good. I um, point to a generalization that we're now using. This is the core idea. The generalization is that we also need a condition of dissatisfaction. That is, in some cases, we need to say not, the, the prediction was not fulfilled. And I'm now giving up and doing something else. That's a very general problem in psychology. It happens. Um, um, for instance, if you, if you, <clears throat> the classical example is change detection, where you're supposed to pick up that something changed. And if something didn't change, then what? At some point, you say mm, nothing changed. Um, you're all familiar with that when you're looking for you know, this toy example, you look for the differences. You have some cartoons and you have to say how many differences there are. And at some point, you have to give up and say, Maybe they, I, have, I don't find anything. And um, that's a so-called stopping problem. <clears throat> and there are ways to deal with that. And so the generalization, I just hinted that is that the condition of satisfaction is based on match. So you, you have a, a match which compares a, um, you know, a perceptual information or, or mental information that is this outcome and the prediction. And when it matches, it finds the condition of satisfaction. But you can also have a mismatch. So for instance, you can, yeah, by making one of those inhibitory and the other excitatory, you can actually make that a neural representation will not fire, not create a peak when they are matching and only fire when they're not matching. And then that would actually drive a non-match response, which would be always competing with a match response. And uh, so you can have two things. You can have a non-match, which would step, stop the match response. And that's, that's a condition of dissatisfaction that you're saying, no, this, this is wrong. And you can also have a failure to get a match, even though you have enough time. And then you would just by default say that you're going to, um, be dissatisfied. And that happened what uh, in this hypothesis testing business happened. And then you find the condition of dissatisfaction. Takes a little bit more <clears throat> time perhaps to understand all of that fully, but this is well understood that machinery. Just using detection and reverse detection instability combined in somewhat ingenious forms. Um, okay, so that's, um, I'll respond to that question. But that's how you, you end a state. So there's a question if the principle of using a pre-shape like we used as a bias Gaussian in yesterday's exercise um, is the principle, is that as a bias Gaussian, you could, um, one could think of it that way. I mean, it's here more specific. You know, usually, usually bias, th you think of bias perhaps as something that, um, like in, in, in Bayesian terms, you think of bias as something that reflects longer term experience, something you've learned or, so, prior information that you have, while here it's just prior to that particular event, just, just er, a little earlier to that particular event. Um, but logically, it's the same sort of thing. It's just a bias that arose from an expectation that you have 
and you can have that explanation just because you got a, a queue just before or here because you have a particular task, particular intention. So I, it's actually kind of interesting. I find that in terms of processes, these play the same role. So the the long term bias that people think of as as being part of um, Bayesian statistics is really just sort of one limit case where you have learned and it's part of your structure something about prior information, but you could have prior information that just comes from one processing step before or two or very recent, or it just comes because you're um, working on a task and multiple uh, components are not synchronous. And so there's a question if the principle of um, conditional satisfaction and conditional dissatisfaction is connected to predictive coding. <laughs> Uh, there is a connection. Um, that's a very good question. And actually, I've uh, sort of uh, had a diverse, um, diverse or, or, or contrarian discussions about that. Um, so in, in one way, it is uh, consistent with, you know, predictive coding actually has two contradictory parts, right? In, in one part, you're saying, um, that things that you can predict, you don't actually encode. So when you have sensor information, you're only encoding the new stuff. That's how predictive coding is actually used in engineering. Um, and the other part is the opposite, is where you're um, essentially using the prediction and the sensor information in an optimal way, which is what Kalman filtering is about, or you know, Bayesian estimation is about, where you're saying, I'm correcting my sensory information by my prediction, and I have some uh, understanding of how much I should trust my prediction, how much I should trust uh, the new part. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion about these two senses, because the theory is so general and mostly used metaphorically, people don't really notice that difference, even though there has been some technical papers about that conflict. Um, so here, um, the prediction is used really for process control. And, 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 and I think that's not something that predictive coding really has addressed. I think, firstly, my criticism is always that predictive coding is a very, is ultimately somewhat vacuous concept. It's only seemingly uh, cognitive, but it isn't actually. And uh, you can see this also in the question of level. Uh, at which level do you do that? So for instance, one wouldn't do a, uh, a theory of uh, you know, predict um, very low level sensor information. It's really not true uh, empirically that you uh, uh, predict and you know so in other words because prediction means that you represent independently of current sense information right that you have a way of maintaining that activation and we don't have that for highly variant information for instance luminance dependence uh, illumination dependence on you know particularly the visual appearance of things and in fact between two two saccades you retain very little perception information about objects in the world so there's actually a, a preferred level of description, which could be viewed as a level of abstraction or of uh, invariance at which you make predictions and predictions that have behavioral significance. So the behavioral significance I'm talking about here is controlling this sequence of thoughts or actions. Another form of um, in which prediction actually makes uh, has behavioral consequences is in anticipating things. So, for instance, when you're catching a ball, you're not reacting to the visual image. You're actually anticipating, uh, predicting, for instance, time to contact, predicting when the ball will be reachable. Uh, and that's the only chance you have to overcome the delays that are in, involved in generating movement. And so that's, you could think of that as a more specific form of the kind of prediction I'm talking about. And so, in other words, this role, uh, the controlling behavior and generating behavior and base that on prediction, that is a, a form of prediction that happens at the appropriate levels, we would say conceptual, highly invariant levels, and it wouldn't happen at the low level sensor information. So, uh, you know, the apostle of, uh, of this, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, they call it this, uh, I forgot that, you know, Friston's uh, notion, I forgot the term he uses, uh, is a, can be criticized as, and he, he claims that you're making this prediction at every level. I don't think that's true. There's an interesting link here. I'll, I'll look that up. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is a long standing debate. It's coming up periodically. I'm old enough not to have seen this time and again. 
Um, yeah, so it's complicated that relationship. Good. So last uh, point uh, of of this topic is what is the next state that you then select right how does that come about and i, I want to refer to three notions that are in the literature this is not original to us we're just implementing that and i'll illustrate that so these three notions have been referred to there's a review article by henson and Burgesco, you know old by your standards probably and it's even older than that i don't know where that originally came from maybe even Maybe, uh, uh, I forgot the name, it's, it's probably very classical. I don't know the exact history of that. And these three notions still seem to span the space of possibilities that we know. Uh, so one idea is gradient-based selection, the other is chaining, and the third is positional. And all three are being used in our models. And I'll uh, just go through those and explain those to you. And so the gradient-based uh, thought is that, um, when you have, when you're in that moment where you make a selection of what to do next, that you, it's somehow based on rate, that, that there is different levels of activation and the most activated wins. Um, it's easiest in the uh, case when you talk about sale, and so it's really input driven that you're attending to the next most active uh, object. So for instance, visual search in the way that Raul Grieben will be explaining has a slot for that. I'm not sure he's actually going to talk about that because somewhat advanced topic, but yeah, there is a possibility that you would be biased toward um, salient, object salient ultimately means there's a lot of neural energy in the different feature channels, something that's large or very bright or has a lot of contrast, and that there would be biased to select that. And that leads to very meaningful sequence generation if you also have a way to control that. For instance, in the example that he has, uh, if the, after you've done that, you you lower the level of activation by a system that is a memory of where you attended called inhibition of return, and then you can actually control that amplitude. And have been detailed models. Uh, Stephen Grossberg has a uh, model um, with uh, someone with whom we worked whose name I just uh, forgot, um, who show intricate neural mechanisms of how you could actually control the amplitude of different inputs to encode a particular serial order. Um, so this is a principle that we're using a lot. It, it is not always formalized in that way. So um, even in this uh, grounding example, there will be, in many cases, there are essentially competitions of multiple um, uh, concept nodes and which one gets activated when you describe and uh, which object will you pay, pay attention to? Well, it can be based on salience. In the simplest example it is, but you could also uh, bias that by uh, boosting you know, particular things you, which, which control what you pay attention to that you're really interested in a certain class of objects and, and, and that your description should focus on that. So for instance, we know that humans tend to pay attention to people and faces in visual scenes and will refer to those more often than to you know, some element, some dead element of the environment. Um, so that's uh, so, so it can be from input, but it can also be, for instance, from convergence of multiple different sources of specification that those objects or those representations on which a lot of activated substructures converge will have the largest amplitude. So that's certainly a, uh, there's a lot of evidence that such things happen. And that's something that is used in our architectures. <clears throat> yeah. Um, chaining is an, an idea that, that's also very old. And it there's also some good evidence for that, uh, if, especially in uh, very peripheral motor habits. Um, I already you know, fixed sequences, for instance. Um, we used it in this example of the grounding where we had a fixed order, whether you first uh, look at the reference object and then at the target object or the other way around. It's not as flexible, right? It's a sort of a fixed system where there is a successor task. You can think of, for instance, one problem with chaining is that if you, if uh, in the example I showed you, you, you search for red and then if some if, if you have a complex sequence where red is followed by yellow first and then later red is followed by blue, then change doesn't really work because every time you're at red, you would have to go to uh, 
yellow. And what you have to do is introduce two flavors of red, the one that's followed by yellow and the other that's followed by blue. And you can see how that becomes uh, somewhat uh, circular in logic. Um, and, and that maybe reflects that it's not a very flexible system. Uh, one, they, again, there is some evidence that we sometimes have, you know, make mistakes that are consistent with chaining. And I'll show you in a moment that the positional system, which is the most general system, can <clears throat> look like chaining if it is highly learned, then it amounts to chaining. And so here's the position system. Position system is essentially saying that you are, that you have separate representation for the order itself and for the contents of what it is that is in the different uh, positions. That is actually what was realized in the serial order machine I showed you. And what you have there is a representation of the ordinal, of the order. We call this an ordinal nodes, it's discrete. You could think of this embedded in a field different you know, slices of the field re reflect different times and you could uh, different um, ordinal positions in the serial <clears throat> and you could maybe represent how clear you are about that order by, by uh, tuning a little bit the spatial position. And so uh, what you have to have if, essentially that that ordinal representation is a chaining or, or organization that is you arrange through some neural connectivity that uh, let's say when this node is active the next node to be active when there is an inhibition is then the next higher one and then the next higher one and so on so in, in one version this uh, of our models it happens by having two nodes uh, the production node and a working memory node when the production node is on it activates a work memory node which pre-activates, pre-shapes the, the next node, but because they're all inhibitory, only one can be on, so this node is not on. When you're then inhibiting the entire production system, the memory system is still on. And so once you release from inhibition, it's the successor of this memory node that is going to be activated. So in a gradient selection, right, this one is going to be activated. That's how the sequence generation then <clears throat> happens. Um, the contents would be uh, represented elsewhere. For instance, you would have some feature representations where you could have memory peaks or have learned like memory trace or have been learning. You could by having learning project onto those. And so what the idea would be that you're learning these connections to project onto these other nodes. That's actually what happened in the uh, Yulia architecture that I just showed you. That, that's, that's part of that architecture as so well. These connections are learned by having learning actually, literally. Um, and the, the rest I explained. So that's the ordinal system. And, and the positional representation, you know, it's the most flexible. You can represent anything. The, the cost of that is that you have, and you know, when you say, I learn what the contents is, that means you have to have the corresponding structure, and you have to have synapses that you can strengthen. And, um, you know, it's, it's not clear that you would have an ordinal system that points to everything that you that could possibly happen. Now there is actually some hints that in hippocampus there might be systems like that. You know that in hippocampus there are these sequence you observe sequences. Some it's called replay, where sequences that the animal goes through by spatial navigation uh, sometimes are uh, also experienced when the animal is uh, sleeping. And then there is some bizarre phenomenon called preplay, where a sequence that the animal hasn't yet actually um, done is mentally happens so in the neural recording happens before that experience. There's an animal is sleeping and you're seeing a sequence of activation patterns in your record neurons. And then the next day you put this uh, animal into an environment and you learn that environment and you see that sequence that neural sequence that it was previously having. So that hints that there is a fixed neural circuitry that makes that sequence and the association with a particular spatial location happens then when it's learning the space. I, I don't know how well established that is. I'm not really a hippocampal researcher. One of my colleagues in Bochum, uh, Zhen Cheng, is actually looking into issues like that. Um, so that's interesting because hippocampus is so connected to so many representations in, in the brain in cortex, so it might have the potential to have all these connections. In practice, you would have to assume that there are many different ordinal systems around that can project to different things like uh, sequences of uh, 
perceptual events, of motor events, of purely mental events and so on, because it would be insane to assume that you would have one ordinary system that can point to anything and there will be overbreath. So there must, must, this is a possible field of study to find out what constraints you have at that level. And you can see how that leads to chaining. That is, if you, if you have a system like that and the pointing is quite fixed because it's now really learned something like a habit, then that would have the property of chaining because you would always go through the same um, elements and uh, would have a hard time uh, skipping one, for instance. <clears throat> So here, uh, on close this by um, showing a demo that puts all of that together. Uh, here is a the, uh, model that we did more recently. It's sort of essentially the version of the Julia dissertation work more uh, sophisticated <laughs> rather than a, a vehicle running. It's a, a robot pointing at stuff. So in here is the serial order machine, right? These are the ordinal nodes. They're all inhibitorily coupled and they have a memory node, work memory that always biases the selection of the subsequent sequence and are self-sustained. And in this case, they also point to color. So these color connections are learned and we modeled how the learning happens and how the activation happens. And then this, this is essentially just the visual, again, a, a simplified version of the visual search machine that I already showed several times now, driven by the camera. And this is a simplified version of reaching, which is something that's also within reach of the, um, not sure, no, I, I don't think you're, we have a project on that in the in the workshop, yeah, where, where you can build a simple version of that. And so uh, what this does is, is, you know, the robot is shown an arbitrary se sequence, here's the camera, it's shown a color sequence, and it is tested by assembling that uh, scene on the table, and you can should put this anywhere and the robot will then point at the different objects in different, uh, you know, in the right order. And it's pointing only by positioning the tool on top of that, it's just a 2D thing. Um, and it does take a different amounts of time, you know, here not so as dramatically as the vehicle because the reaching is relatively easy to do. And if you look inside, you can really understand how that happens, you know, the different order nodes are switched by conditions of satisfaction whenever the condition of satisfaction happens. And in fact, uh, here's the relevant plot. When the, the condition of satisfaction here is that the robot arms position overlaps with the target position. So target position, here's the match. Now. So the arms uh, position is estimated and when it overlaps, then you're done. And uh, you can probe that by, for instance, um, uh, here you, you can prop that by making a target jump, like here, the target, uh, the blue was the target currently, and it jumped, I mean, we, we pushed into a new location, and therefore the match doesn't happen. I think it's here at this time slice, it reached to the old location, right, and match didn't happen. And that makes that the system makes a new movement is a little, uh, don't expel that just a little reactivation and then goes to the correct target. So online updating, oh, that's sort of the feature that you get out of doing it in this dynamic way. This is emergent from that approach. In other words, you don't have to program an exception case. And how, if this happens to that, it's actually a property of that approach. There are a lot more uh, details to be understood about that but let's maybe not go into that too much. Good. <clears throat> so I want to uh, use, uh, I think I still have a little bit of time, right? I have, uh, I think, still about 30 minutes, right? Unless I'm wrong. And so uh, I want to use a little bit of time not to really discuss and um, reflect on, uh, on things. Um, so, so one question is, you know, how, how far do we go there? These examples are still very simple. And, and so does this, how far does this reach? I'll, I'll show you a brief sketch of what Jan will be elaborating on Friday to illustrate how we think about that. And then I, I can discuss some limitations and you know, some fronts of research. And so in, in 
thinking about that, how far can we go? How cognitive can we become? We have started to really use this concept of intentionality. And this is the concept that's actually used by philosophers. Um, it's the int intentionality is, is defined as the capacity of the nervous system to generate mental states that are about things in the world that are about something. Uh, so that um, that's very general because if you think about the organism itself, you know the, the nervous system, the mind is one thing, and then the, you have the body. And if you think of about the body as being part of the world, then it's also about your body. For instance, you want your body to do something like lift my arm, right? Then. I can say that is an intentional state. Um, and um, you can even go further and can say the things that the nervous system is, can create um, states about is also the nervous system itself. So you could say, I can make intentional states that are about other states of the nervous system. And then you can do very interesting stuff, you know, that actually John Searle has proposed in, that intentionality is a necessary condition for consciousness, um, maybe not sufficient, but it's, uh, it says that only intentional states that have this aboutness to them uh, are candidates to become conscious. So that's why we're sort of really attracted to it. It's very, very general. And so we've taken constraints from this reflection about what it means to have a mind to, um, to see if they are compatible or how we can express them in our thinking. Uh, so two, two important constraints are uh, what, what John Sir calls directions of fit. Uh, they have to do with the condition of satisfaction now taken as a logical condition that establishes that an intention has been satisfied. So the condition of uh, satisfaction that we've used so far is what, what he calls um, the world to mind direction of fit. And that would be what we usually think of daily life as intentionality, that is motor intentions. You want to achieve something and you're done when that what you achieve, want to achieve has taken place. So that could be a movement. You know, so I always take this example of lifting your arm. You want to lift your arm. And when your arm is up there and it is up there because you try to lift it, then that uh, intention, uh, the condition of satisfaction for that intention has been realized. And you could think about that, you know, about doing that about other states in the world. Um, but logically, you could say that perception style and stuff is also uh, intentional state because when you're perceiving an object, uh, I perceive here uh, this cup, then there is something in my mind that is about this cup out in the world. And um, it's satisfied when the representation in my mind matches that object in the world. So it's a mind to world direction of fit. Um, it's not the world that has to change to do that. Uh, so that is uh, not what people usually don't call that intention, but philosophers do. Philosophers, since going back to, um, let's forget the names of everyone. Um, the, uh, yeah, sorry, can't activate the name right now, but it's, it's a very classical notion. It goes back to the 19th century. Um, so, so that covers pretty much everything that we would want to think of as representation, cognitive state, and so on, will be intentional in these two senses. And these make uh, process differences, how we do this in, in the mind. And then uh, Jan Zuckerberg will, will show you that a little bit. Um, to make this more concrete, we're also taking... Um, uh, yeah, no, no, actually, for, first let's go, go through some of these consequences. So when we think of these conditions of satisfaction, these directions of fit as something that we now implement by neural process, then we see that they have slightly different possibilities. So for instance, um, the, the, the regular motor intentionality, you know, controls, as I showed, the sequential unfolding of actions or of thoughts. Uh, it's critical to initiating action. It's also critical to terminating actions. Sorry, no, attention is critical to uh, initiating actions and satisfaction is critical to terminating actions. And, um, and actually something follows from that, which is that uh, 
the that after you're done, the condition of satisfaction. So the, the intention is gone once you're done, right? You're not keeping the intention. The intentional state is terminated by condition of satisfaction. Well, if you think about the uh, uh, intentional state, then the intentional state uh, itself is its own condition of satisfaction because that process that makes the, the uh, person arise is the process that ensures the match. Um, and therefore, the intention state actually persists after the event that made the condition of satisfaction, right? It's a different temporal order. So, um, so when I look at something and I detect or recognize it as an object, then I, the condition of satisfaction is met. That would be, for instance, through a change detection. I'm seeing something that wasn't there before, and then I have that person in, in my consciousness or have it in memory. And... Um, and then that state persists. I, I keep perceiving that or keep memorizing or, or having it active in memory um, without checking the condition of satisfaction at any time. In fact, there can be mistakes like that. For instance, uh, there could be failure to detect change, which is called change blindness. And that really does occur in some circumstances or misperception, right? Uh, illusion, uh, illusions up to hallucinations, which are real, they, they can happen. And they are properties of, in a sense, of the neural implementation of such intentional states. So there's interesting consequences from looking at things from this perspective. Um, so the other thing which I tried first was going to jump to uh, is that we're also um, using a little bit more loosely defined notions that of psychological modes. Not sure how universal that is, but it's sort of an, an, a scale along which you can think about how embodied or sensory motor something is. And it hasn't really led us to interesting insights. Uh, so Sora proposes that one can build intention states uh, by thinking about uh, six psychological modes, three mind to world and three world to mind. Uh, mind to world would be very simply perception, memory, and we're not talking about working memory, we're talking about actual uh, long-term memory, and then beliefs, which are propositional structures about the world, you know, and, and it's a very general concept, like uh, the belief that, um, that you know, the Biden is the US president will be an example of a belief that's a propositional statement, and there are, the condition of satisfaction is that Biden is president of the United States, right, in, in the world. And so we can see that you can reach very, very much this way. And uh, on the motor side, intention and action is actually the concrete motor action that you're doing at any moment in time. Um, prior intention would be a, 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 an action that you are want to do, but you can't act on it yet because it's um, you know, something needs to be logically the case before you can do it. So, for instance, when you grasp, you first have to reach, you know, and then uh, you can activate the grasping action. You can see that a lot of motor actions are like that. You can almost see what actions here my kids plan when they play soccer. This is two decades ago. So, um, see that my daughter is maybe not really intending to hit the ball. She's just watching the ball uh, while this boy is actually really trying to, to hit the ball, I think. Uh, so prior intention would be these things that uh, are actionable but are not yet activated. While the things that you more globally uh, want, what we usually would call goals, are called desire by uh, by Sarah. That's one of the frontiers to understand that better. That, so now what's a step from desire to prior intention would be planning. And it's a part of a neural thinking about cognition that is very underdeveloped. So in, in artificial intelligence, you will have chapters on uh, in the standard textbook, Norvik, let's say, you would have chapters on planning and, and searching uh, action spaces for plans and so on. There is no real neural analog of that, of us understanding, first of all, how humans do that and understanding how neural networks do that. And so that's one of the frontiers, I think, to get there. So see, the, this, these modes are not uh, vacuous. There's a lot of uh, room here for discovering higher forms of cognition. So we're trying to to see how far, so, so if our language is enough to get to, our theory, theory framework is enough to get to these uh, states and what is missing, and, and that's the research problem we're doing. So uh, Jan will present his dissertation work in which he um, created a very simple world and created an intentional agent to orient in that world. It's a 
a system that has, uh, the, you know, the world consists of, of objects, um, colored objects again, because we can implement that very easily. Uh, and we had um, two things here, uh, paint buckets, which uh, in the original work were tall. Now we think that it would have been better to consider those the buckets. And canvases, stuff that you can paint, uh, those were the small things that would have been better than maybe the other way around. And, and there's a vehicle with an arm, and uh, the vehicle actually has um, a paint device that you know, is just simulated. So it can pick up paint from a bucket and then apply the paint to an object, and so it can paint stuff. And it can move around uh, the world, uh, and it can move that arm. Uh, so it moving in, it's only moving a one, along this uh, line of objects, so 1D. It can reach and take up paint. It can reach and apply a coat of paint. Right? And this applying region is just a binary switch that we simulate. We don't have all, no real, real brush in there. But the action, the movement of the arm is really modeled like a human arm movement model with detail, timing, and all that. So its perception is simple color. And as a, another feature, the height feature, we can see the, the height of objects. And it can have all kind of proprioceptive sensors knowing what's, where it is, where, where its arm is, and if its paint is in the, the gripper and so on. And uh, so, the, so, so that's just, just the lower level perception and sensory uh, injection action. It can do some simple sequences like search to paint or search to load paint or, or a reach to apply paint and so on. And it, its main form of memory is a scene memory. It, uh, it's like in the models I showed you, it can store sp feature space maps. And because it has this limited view, it only sees some part of, you know, the part of the scene that is uh, not trivial, right? When it's just visual exploration, it really needs to move to see the objects and build a scene memory. Um, and the main thing is that Jan has found an approach to endowed that system with beliefs. The beliefs are about contingencies in the world. So what we did is, is we had some arbitrary color uh, superposition rules. So when you apply a particular paint to a particular uh, canvas of a particular color, then some color emerges, not like in the real world, just some arbitrary thing that uh, was programmed into the simulator. And the system learns about that and then can use that knowledge to achieve particular colors. Like if it wants to have yellow, it can uh, uh, recognize that blue and green will give you yellow and it can look for a, a blue canvas and find a green paint bucket and then achieve that outcome. It's a whole sequence of events can do. So the, the poorest level uh, in the model is desires, which are really just desire for a particular color. And that will be interesting maybe too understand richer space of possible desires. So this is the architecture that Jan will be presenting to you that in, in, in essentially is consists just of the sort of things that uh, we've talked about. It has these six modes, you know, perception, memory, belief, and intention, action, prior intention, desire, desire being the somewhat trivial uh, version. Uh, so in, in the motor, it's the sort of stuff that you know, it, uh, you know, it's hardware here and it uh, can do reaching. I, I didn't expect exactly how that uh, can happen. <clears throat> Visual search is actually, in a sense, a motor-like intentional state uh, because you're trying to achieve something. Um, and I, uh, I think, not go, I don't know how deep Jan is going to go into that. So, so behind each of those are, again, because, you know, CEDAR, architectures, some of which are quite complex and huge that bring about all these different things. So for instance, a real motor system with a uh, system that generates time courses of the arm to move the arm in a particular location. So for instance, here, <clears throat> this system is moving to this object and picks up paint, this is a paint bucket, you know, and this movement here is regenerated autonomously, picking up something and uh, some internal stuff happening here. And then it moves there and applies the paint to that. Here, yeah, see this contingency that that apparently gives yellow and it moves the arm back. And so again, the important thing is all of these discrete things is just a continuous dynamics running and going through these instabilities. It's not an algorithm that does anything. It's just one big differential equation that leads to these 
discrete looking things. No, that's sort of the amazing part. So I was going to present all of that. Um, Jan will be doing that. It's, and the one core new thing that he will present is how to learn beliefs. Beliefs are, in this case, triples that associate the color of a surface, the color of a, no, sorry, this is the color of, a, of the paint that you have in your uh, gripper or that is in a paint bucket and the color of a surface and then the outcome color that is generated. And these three need to be associated. There's a whole machinery of how to autonomously do that. That's autonomous learning, how to detect that. Something like that happened and that you now learn that that happens and then you should be able to use it later. And I'll talk about that. Okay. So, 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 so there are some franchises. What, do, what does this mean? So I, I want to close by uh, discussing uh, some of the significance of that. So I'll talk a little bit about how, how come that we can scale this up this way? How is it, uh, you know, how do these embodied architectures relate to classical architectures? What does embodiment really mean? How does it relate to other approach, especially this uh, question with the distributed representations, high dimensional vectors. So this is quite unusual in the connection sense of where, where are we there? I'll briefly refer to vector symbolic architectures. So this is more the discussion part. And we can expand that if you want in, in online discussion. So let's first talk about architecture. So why is it possible that we're just putting together all these different fields into these huge architectures and everything works you know you, you you can make it work by tuning it and you had those of you who did the exercise already experienced that a little bit that you can assemble these architectures i'm not saying that the tuning is always very easy but it is way easier than it was for instance when people built analog computers when they took a lot of you know circuits together and built a large computer and, and, and part of the problem in these analog computers was that when you added a new element um, then everything else was changed and, and solutions that you had tuned to arise may no longer have arisen because you added a transistor to that system. And the digital computer is organized the way it is exactly to prevent that. So in digital computer, the flip-flop is essentially creating a bistable system. And it is designed such that when you add other flip-flops to the computer within your architecture, the function of each individual uh, flip-flop is not affected by that. So that it scales, that you can add more and more memory and more and more processing power and still have the same description for the previous circuits as you had before. So that's a, uh, a problem of scaling that is unique to the process itself, uh, a dynamical form of modularity. And in the in dynamic field theory, this is comes from the attractor states and the, the stability. So I, uh, I think I mentioned that at the beginning that when you have stability in the attractor sense, you also get what is called mathematically structural stability. That is that the solutions remain invariant as you change the equation a little bit. It's always a limit, but within a, a in the mathematical sense, there's a whole environment in parameter space around the equation that you have within which the same solution still be, will be observed. For instance, in the sense of uh, qualitatively same, no, it's just a little distortion, but no cut, no, no bifurcation, for instance. And so structural uh, stability is implied by stability. Uh, and when you're Building an architecture, you could think of the architecture as being a change of the equation because new terms are added to the equation that you're looking at as you're embedding that equation in an architecture. And so what we're saying is that when the um, dynamics of the subsystem you're looking at uh, is weakly affected, remains invariant, under adding these other terms, you know, then you have mod modularity and that's good. And that is uh, essentially what the attractor states uh, do for us. Mathematically, you expand that, you can actually say that what we call the dynamic regime that's in the attractor state plus the bifurcations of that, that that whole thing remains invariant. Uh, even though the exact point where the transition, the instability occurs might be shifted a little bit, but that the bifurcation diagram is preserved. And so that is an intrinsic property of the way we built 
uh, the systems from attractors and uh, their instabilities. And that's why we are so conservative about doing that. We don't want to just use anything like transients or uh, you know, spiking patterns or anything because of this property. Only if we do this right, will the system scale, we'll have that dynamic modularity. And so that's something that actually has been achieved. It's not been achieved in an exact mathematical sense. It is, there are limits, uh, you know, you, you see that when you tune, there are limits where it will break down. This is only a mathematical in the sense of infinitesimally, you know, the, how large the range is or which this invariance is true, we can't really establish theoretically. So but it's quite possible that in the nervous system, there, is, there are also limits to that and some of the mistakes we can make as humans might be uh, probing these limits and capacity limits that we have might reflect these limits. Now, that's not actually the modularity that a lot of cognitive um, architecture people or computer scientists talk about. When they talk about modularity, they talk about encapsulation. That is that a module is, uh, it's well-defined what a module exchanges with other modules. Uh, for instance, information processing the module is a function, a function call, right? And uh, it gets an input and it gets an output. And the inner states, how you compute that function shouldn't matter and is hidden. That's called encapsulation. They don't have, don't have access to that, which is has advantages in terms of computer science for certain purposes that you, you don't need, you, you can use it in a new context. You don't need any implicit, you know, information or implicit assumptions about what variables would have which value when you use that function. It's all defined in the interface. It is uh, used in, um, in, in cognitive architectures models in the same way, uh, like R, ACT R and SOAR and so on. In some sense, it's in, implicit in uh, neural network models as well, in that you're assuming that when you have a neural network model, like a deep network, for instance, that it's, uh, it creates a particular representation. When you say, you know, this represents, you know, faces, or this represents, uh, I don't know, co concepts, object categories, then you're assuming that that will always be the case independent of whether, whether you think something else or whether something else in the brain is happening. But whenever these neurons fire, they always mean the same thing. That's not trivial, right? Uh, as we know from classical um, computing architectures. Uh, and that's also not automatically the case in dynamical field theory. So when we put up down an architecture like that and say, oh, this represents the code color, or this represents uh, some spatial feature map, that's only true as I point out in the introductory lecture by virtue of the connectivity between this particular field and the sensory surface or and the motor surface. And that can be quite a complex path of connectivities. So what we're actually um, postulating as well is that the overall architectures are organized in a specific way so that there is no conflict that the, that when I say this field is about color, that there are no conditions under which that is no longer true. And now it's actually about pitch or about, you know, orientation or whatever, that, that there is, you know, if there are multiple parts from the sensory surface, that they're all consistent with each other. I sometimes call that the non-synesthesia principle. That is, you're not allowing uh, connectivity patterns in that system that would create that neurons that represent color and are sometimes represent pitch, for instance, right? And synesthesia would be when people actually have the impression that they see uh, something uh, like they, 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 that, that a tone becomes associated with a color, for instance. And maybe there are limits you know, in the nervous system where sometimes that principle is uh, violated. So this is an additional principle that we haven't um, formalized and that actually a lot of uh, connections to architects also sort of implicitly assume that uh, you have that form of consistency. And... Um, it doesn't arise so much as a problem in those who are, remain very close to the nervous system when they model neural networks because the nervous system, the, the, the brain in a sense, is a specific architecture. You know, it might sound very trivial, but it's not trivial compared that to the program of artificial intelligence or cognitive science. Uh, you know, 
we're assuming that there is, you know, visual cortex and audit, uh, auditory cortex and so much sensory cortex and motor and so on. It's, in fact, we know that in evolution, that macrostructure of our nervous system is highly invariant. For instance, the motor system, in, in one of the more difficult to understand systems, maybe the most difficult to understand system is highly invariant in evolution. The last one and a half million years, um, you see that different species are uh, in some sense um, isomorphic and they, 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 it takes different forms sometimes you know the different subsystems but but they are uh, you can sort of map the functions onto each other stan grillner for instance has uh, made that point in studying um a a, a simple vertebrate um c elegance i think he, he mapped that out and, and and made that point um and, and so when we when we write down these intention systems, we're, we're really something that doing something that is where the assumptions it will be a specific system that has specific subsystems that are organized such that this informational modularity is generated. And so when you want to do learning, you would have to make sure that that remains true. And I think the way that deep networks are currently used, learning just about anything will not be right under such general circumstances. And, and these deep learning systems typically are highly specialized for one particular task, and that's why it doesn't show up. But if you had a, uh, would, try, would try to learn from scratch a system that is as flexible as our mind, then you would actually have to make sure that this form of informational modularity applies. And that's actually not obvious, huh? it's, it's not automatic. That, that would happen. That's a bit of a subtle point. Good. Happy to take questions anytime now. Um, so uh, another clarification I want to make is that what, what embodiment means. You know, that this uh, is for those who know a little bit about embodiment and uh, very different notions about embodiment. Uh, and so one notion that was around for a while is that well, cognition always involves somehow a motor or cognition is always based on sensory stuff. So for instance, there's these embodiment effects where uh, when you think about push, let's say, uh, or, or toward as a concept, uh, and then you, you're in a motor context where you're pu pu pushing something versus pulling. Actually, I'm doing this the wrong way right now. And um, then there are subtle differences depending on your motor state, the cognitive state will be activated a little later, a little, little less and so on. But this has been criticized because these effects are small. They are not mandatory. You have to create special conditions to observe them. And in my view, this is sort of a distortion because what we're saying is there is a possibility to link cognition to motor systems and systems, but not a necessity. And that possibility implies constraints, because if you can link something to sensor and motor, then you have the properties. You have to have stability properties. You have to con state, continuous state, continuous time, gradedness. Um, if you don't have that, it will be brittle, will not work. But it doesn't mean that it actually have to, has to be always motor, right? And, and, and so this claim that embedded cognition is only about um, the automatic activation of motor system is, is sort of a distortion because it's this possibility and whether or not you activate the motor system is still something that can be uh, varied across tasks. So what I call the embodiment hypothesis is that cognitive uh, processes inherit the properties of sensory motor because of this possibility of link and also the evolutionary and developmental emergence from sensory motor. Um, and, and essentially, that would mean that cognition emerges from these same kind of neural networks that were developed for sensory motor in evolution, and that develop in early in, in human development, primarily in sensory motor tasks, and therefore they inherit the properties. And the brain looks for pretty much the same across different areas uh, as you go further from the sensory motor surfaces. Still looks very much the same, um, but you could still distinguish tasks by how strongly they do engage motor and sensory systems. That's just a clarification. 
<clears throat> the third clarification I want to make is there are going to be four, so we're almost done. The third clarification I want to make is <clears throat> how you know how is higher cognition uh, uh, reached? So, so what is entailed in reaching it? Uh, so the examples I gave was were these examples about grounding, mental map formation, and now this sequence generation. And we're doing things around this. Uh, currently, there's projects like, um, you know, sequ processes, how you establish analogy, for instance, or um, I could think of um, other, I don't remember right now, <laughs> other uh, abstract uh, processes. And um, so, so how is that general? And um, if you think about information processing kind of views of cognition, they're ultimately relying on functions, right? On function calling. So when, you, when you're able to, uh, let's say, compute the outcome of uh, an arithmetic operation, then you, uh, you, you say, I have an uh, adding function and I can give it arguments and then I can return the value. In fact, this example of mental arithmetic is the workhorse of uh, Act R, one of the cognitive architectures that are used to explore the structure of the mind through models like that. And so central to that is this idea of function call, which of course um, is consistent with a computer metaphor because computers, uh, you know, Turing, uh, or it's actually for Neumann architectures, um, are organized to do that. They supply the arguments by access to memory in technical terms through pointing perhaps, but classically you know, by loading uh, the memory into the C CPU that would then uh, implement the function. And the function is also uh, in the memory. Um, and that is something that isn't obvious in neural networks as such. And as some of you might know, there was a, a big debate in Connection between connectionists and classical information processing people, maybe now forgotten, but it doesn't actually mean that it was resolved. Was the debate was around the the forming of the past tense of verbs, um, like you know, uh, for regular verbs, for instance, uh, like uh, I don't know. Uh, I always think now of irregular verbs. Um, I opened the window. I opened. The window, I add the e, e, d to form the past tense, right? And uh, you, you know, in the classical form, you would say, well, I have a function where I put in the verb and I can return the past tense of that verb. And, um, and, and the proof of that would be that you can do that for pseudo words. So a word you never heard before, but let's say that's consistent with some phonetic rules or still sounds like a word then you can build the past tense of that. Actually, the German speak among you might be very familiar with us in academia in Germany. Uh, we're using often English terms and applying German um, conjugation to that. Uh, uh, like we say, gebootet. I, I boot my computer uh, I, and then you form uh, the past and the perfect uh, in the German way of this English word boot. Um, and you can perfectly do that. And so there was a debate, you know, how, how is that done by a neural network? Um, because in the neural network, presumably when you've never heard that word before, you don't have a neural substrate for it. And therefore the function that will be a neural network that you know, takes input from a particular network and puts it somewhere else, you know, how, how, how can you apply that network to a representation that you've never had before, where you didn't have a, a chance to learn the connections? And there's a subtle stuff uh, in, in linguistics that was used as an argument in different ways, uh, not all of which I understand. Now, our answer to that in these simplistic terms that we've been able to reach so far is that um, it's based, this, this idea is based on co uh, coordinate transforms. It's actually, first of all, based on the peaks, the, the instabilities localized uh, representations, which really means that we we can bring up in a representation the thing that is currently the argument, the target or the reference, right? It's a one peak out of a continuum of possible peaks. So that's a form of representation using these peaks or blobs as units of representation. And then we were able to apply uh, functions that were encoded in connectivity patterns. Like here, this, this shaded region here, this would be the to the right of operator and it's a synaptic pattern, 
where there's more synaptic strength here than there. And we're able to apply that to any reference object by making the coordinate transform of representing the target centered on the reference object. So that will be our general argument that that is actually how higher cognition occurs by creating the invariance that this implies actively by active transformations. And we believe that these transformations are costly. I, I hinted you know, that 2D coordinate transforms are require 4D steerable maps for quite costly. They will not happen a lot in the nervous system. They will be things that are hard to learn and they um, you will want to use the same ones time and again. And that's the whole idea of using uh, spatial mapping for analogy, for instance, the structure mapping hypothesis, for instance, is something we're currently looking into as how, how that can be used in this way, how, how coordinates transforms in space can therefore be lifted to some other domains. There's this whole idea of uh, Foucault, you know, conceptual spaces that you would have some spatial arrangement of ideas and apply operators on that spatial arrangement. That will be an how you could lift that. That's like future work that one can do of that. That's sort of the idea. That's how the higher cognition comes about. And so this is all based on this idea of localist representations. There was a debate about localist versus distributed, also sort of like in the late 80s, early 90s, also largely forgotten, although it sometimes shows up now in the deep learning literature where people are very pragmatic, they don't think about things very rigorously sometimes. Um, and deep networks seem to mix these two. Sometimes they have localist, like in the readout level, they have localist representations where one neuron stands for something particular, something fixed, while everywhere else they have distributed representation. That is, you have complex vectors of activation and, um, and the, the vectors standing for different things are you know maybe orthogonal to each other, but they involve all the different neurons. So the neurons are not part of just one vector and other neurons part of another vector, but neurons contribute to multiple vectors. Distributed representations are much more efficient. That is, you need a smaller number of neurons to um, represent more different things. That's well known uh, in the corresponding theory. Uh, so when we're using localist representations, very costly, and you could say the fields, you know, it's a very costly thing. The field means you have a lot of neurons and they're just there to, represent one dimension, right? Uh, well, if you, if you think of 100 neurons in distributed coding, they already represent 100 dimensions, every neuron being one dimension. So, so we could say they are low dimensional, the representations, or we could say they are very costly, very high dimensional neural substrate for low dimensional stuff. Now, it's a real hypothesis that that would be the case. It could be wrong. It's, it's a very strong hypothesis. So where, where does it come from? It comes from this need to organize interaction in a way that keeps activation patterns stable that are not uh, memories, that are not known specifically. So, you know, the one model, sorry, uh, I thought I had a slide in here with that. And then I'm... so the, the one neural network model that does this is the Hopfield model. And some of you might know the Hopfield model is a model in which you can create attractors, stable states um, that are arbitrary vectors of activation. And you can write down exactly the connectivity uh, you need to make these uh, vectors um, attractors. But um, the connectivity pattern you need for that is specific to every pattern. That's why it's a mo model of memory with the idea that for particular memories, you have particular connectivity patterns. And when you have them, then you can activate that state without necessarily having that state at the input. Um, but you know, when you want to represent something like a mental map, you want to create a, a map of something that you're not currently, uh, don't have currently at the input and that maybe you have never imagined in this form before, but maybe you never thought of a red to the left of a green, let's say. Um, how can you represent that? Um, and, and, and so the answer in the fields is, is that we can only represent low dimensional stuff this way and because we have the machinery for that. We can put a peak anywhere in the field because we have this interaction pattern that's uniform. And this uniformity, local excitation global inhibition, 
doesn't scale to arbitrarily high dimensions, as already answered earlier. And, and so we, we, are, we have a specific form, a specific substrate for uh, thinking, for cognition. And that's the subject of low dimensional spaces. Someone called Gerdenfoss, a philosopher, has argued about that in that direction. So more based on linguistic um, observations. And we are um, hypothesizing that. That's a very strong hypothesis. It could be wrong. And I wanted to uh, end on, uh, on the alternative. So one alternative that is seriously being pursued is vector symbolic architectures. Um, this goes back to Smolensky, I think, um, even though his original paper is like in the 19 something, so 92 or so. So um, in that work, he actually studied role filler binding in a way that I would say would be compatible with TFT. But there have been variants of this. Um, Ross Gaylor, from whom I actually learned that, I really appreciate his uh, input into that many years ago. Someone called Conerva, someone called Plate, whose version we've actually used in some other projects. They are, and there might be more versions. So what they have done is they have um, uh, created a version of um, these vector symbolic architectures where uh, you you have high dimension vectors of neural activation. So every every entry into a vector is a neuron, and they have, they uh, high many neurons and. They are uh, uh, high dimension in the sense you're exploiting all the different possible activation val values. So you don't impose as we do that there is this simple spatial structure that is explained by high, low dimensional dimensions. And these vectors have properties that are attractive. The main property is that when you multiply two such vectors with a scalar product, they tend to be, the scalar product tends to be zero. So they tend to be all orthogonal to each other. So, if you if you if your vector space is high dimension enough, then if you take two random vectors, they are very likely orthogonal to each other. That's a simple observation that uh, you can think about. That that's true, and therefore uh, you can combine these vectors by. So if you make some combination where two vectors combined give a same vector, you know the the original Smolensky idea would make a, a higher dimensional tensor. If you have one vector and another, and you represent every combination of the two the elements, then you have a two-dimensional thing, two-dimensional tensor. And that gets worse and worse. As you combine more stuff, you get more and more high dimension. That's the scaling problem we talked about. And so here the scaling problem is solved in a different way. We solved it by binding through space or through label, these particular architectures. This is an approach where you um, solve the problem through a trick. And the trick is to project back that higher dimensional onto just a vector of the same size. It can be done by, uh, for instance, using convolution and, uh, and there are multiple pros of how to do that. And it's not exactly true. It's sort of approximately true. That is the, there is some information loss, but um, essentially because it's embedded in this high dimensional space where it has this nice property that object uh, vectors tend to be orthogonal to each other, you can clean this up and there's a whole, theory that well developed now of how to do that. So that is an approach that's well developed and that essentially would enable neural vectors to do information processing because here you could take a vector as a message, as a piece of information, hand that you know, to other neural vectors using these operators. If you have a neural network like that, that would actually uh, work like a computer that making function calls you know, and, and you can implement functions that way. So um, it has two problems. Uh, one is a symbol grounding problem that is, you know, the vector is a symbol essentially, and you have to create the symbol. And when you have computed something, then you have to act it out again. So encoding and decoding. So in some approaches, so sort if of you solved in some sense arbitrary, you have some kind of encoding and decoding scheme. Uh, in some cases, you even just take a, a random vector and associate it with the encoding decoding. So <clears throat> this question of how serious that problem is, but it's a problem. And the other problem that was historically criticized is that it's not nearly feasible and it's not feasible in the sense that the firing of these neurons cannot be maintained without input. So if you want to use some symbols, uh, when, which are independent of 
being supported by input, you can't keep them firing because to keep them firing, you'd have to have uh, like work memory, some kind of neural connectivity that stabilizes their firing rate. And for that, you need the connectivity that knows about them. Then you only have hop field for that. And if not, you have fields, but you can't uh, have an arbitrary uh, vector that is stabilized without having the connectivity to keep it stable. So that was one argument why it wasn't taken seriously as a real neurally feasible approach. In the last few years, um, someone, someone called Chris Lysmith has proposed something he called the Neural Engineering Framework, he called it NAFE, that proposes to or claims to have a neural implementation of vector symbolic architectures that solves that problem. And I actually studied that in a lot of detail and it's being used. Uh, and they built higher uh, architectures, called the architectures called SPAWN, which stands for something I don't remember now. And so that is a real alternative to what we're doing. And so is that right? And so we studied that a lot. And um, I think it's actually not, but you know, this is open to debate. Um, I've debated quite controversially with Chris Lysmith, friendly and, and sometimes a little bit more <laughs> tense debates. Um, so the neural engineering framework is actually a simple mathematical trick that he published. Uh, can, it can be really uh, easy to understand how, and this was his original contribution. And what you can do with that is you can take a bunch of spike neur neurons and represent these vectors by these neurons. So the, the populations can be relatively small uh, compared to the effective dimensionality of the vector. So you, you can kind of optimize that. And uh, a lot of the arguments that Chris Lysmith forwards is about the scaling. How many neurons do you need? He, he rejects models because they seem to be too hungry in neurons. And, uh, and so that is actually, a, in a sense, a model neutral thing. That is, you can take any uh, system within some constraints, certainly any neural system, and model it, implement it in spike neural networks that way. Uh, that um, essentially the integrated fire mechanism is at the core of that. So the uh, u dot equals minus u, and that's how he, how he does that. And so you could also implement every dynamic field model in NAFE, and there have been implementations like that. There was, for instance, um, uh, Ragnar, this person who did, works with Knauf on the mental mapping, they implemented um, our mental mapping model with uh, NAFE in spike neural networks. Um, now, the so and, and, and then what you can do is you so so this is based on encoding. That is, when you have a something outside the system, you find the weights of how to map it onto the spike neurons. And then when you implement a architecture, every population of neurons with different neurons has to be connected to the previous one that implements the uh, vector symbolic vector symbolic architectures functions. For instance, let's say if you want to do something like uh, represent some number by a population and then it's squared and it's square root or whatever, some arbitrary um, function like that, you can do that by figuring out the connections between these different populations. And uh, if you look into the detail of that, what that relies on is that you decode the original contents and then re-encode. So they say you don't have to recode, but the connectivity is sensitive to that. That is, and that is how, by doing that, how you ensure that the neurons, the contents isn't lost. That that uh, sort of that replaces the consistent firing. That it will be uh, still true that the neck population represents what was originally put into the system. And I think that that is not um, neurally realistic. That is that is a non local dependency of connectivity is impossible for the brain to learn that. I mean, the, the program that implements these systems can do that by numerical um, optimization, but it's not something that I believe the brain can do or and does. And so I, unless there is some other trick that can do that, and it's not excluded, maybe there is some way of how the nerves could do that, that, that I don't know about. Um, this is not an actual solution. So this is a, a big debate. I think a lot of cognitive scientists are really interested in, in this um, as a possible neural implementation of information processing machines. And we're making the opposite argument. We're saying, 
well, we're implementing information processing only in this coordinate transform way, which is much uh, more constrained. And, and, and that would explain why we're not uh, computers, why we're not actually as, as flexible as computers are. We're, we're not actually information processing machines for sensory motor machines. So that's a, that's a debate that will be going on for a while, I think. So my last slide, um, where we're going. So we're, we're certainly pushing really hard toward um, higher cognition, you know, see how far we can get with this. So uh, for instance, uh, Daniel Zabinas, who will be teaching tomorrow in his own work, who really likes to look at, uh, wants to look at more uh, sequences of relational concepts and building whole phrases on and uh, passing arguments among those and you know how to uh, you know the, the red that is above the green is below the blue and uh, he's just much more interesting examples well here's a good example on, on the screen um, and how to pass the argument from one part to the other and do you have to have perceptual grounding for that or can you do it in some other way um, and uh, Sophie Atka who will be uh, presenting on Friday is thinking about similar things in the space of action. So can you um, take, you know, do sequences of actions and do they have some structure, which we call an action grammar, that enables the passing of arguments so that you can, can do a sequence of actions in order to then achieve a next sequence of actions that built on the previous one? And can you use that to plan actions that reach a goal? That's, that's this frontier that is not very well known. And, and uh, both Sophie, Jan, and we'll may engage others, will be thinking a lot about goals, so how, how to achieve goals, how to achieve planning. This is actually connects ultimately to emotions and, and uh, this whole uh, universe of things that are outside classical cognition, but that are, um, of course, that, that actual minds are about you know minds are not like computer programs that they're waiting for some command to be given they always do something and when they solve a problem then that's that's an achievement that they can tune themselves to that and so that's an interesting concept we'll 